Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Carrie Coogan. I'm Deputy Director of the Kansas City Public Library. And we're almost a month into our 2020 programming. And we're so excited about the speakers and all the presentations that we have lined up for you next month and for this whole year, both here at the library and also at our beautiful downtown location at the Central Library. I hope you'll visit us down there as well. We're especially excited to have Paul Goldberger to talk about an issue that has gained some recent momentum here in Kansas City. I hope you take just a moment to pick up one of our monthly calendars. You can see them right as you step out, out to walk out the door, um, which detail everything that we have coming up in February. And if you haven't already, if you could please sign up, and then you can receive a calendar uh, in the mail from us, or you can get a weekly email blast, or both. I'd like to thank our partners tonight, the Downtown Council for their help, and especially Ann Holiday in bringing Paul here to town. I'd also like to thank here tonight the President of the Board of Trustees for the Kansas City Public Library, Jonathan Kemper. Jonathan is right here. Great. I want to thank you and all of our board members for the continued support and love of the library. Finally, I'd like to thank my public affairs team. Many of them are here tonight. Steve Woolfolk, Steve Weberg, Bethany Talley, Leslie Case, and Lindsay Vogt, just to name a few. These are all of the hardworking people, the incredible dream team that works tirelessly to bring you this top-notch programming all year long. Okay, so I know that everyone in town is thinking about football right now. <laughs> I don't have to explain that, do I? <laughs> But tonight we're going to talk about baseball. Paul Goldberger, in his book, Ballpark Baseball in an American City, says that a downtown baseball stadium, if done right, can be a financial boon as well as a crown jewel for our city. It's been a discussion that we've been having and hearing more and more in Kansas City, in particular since the sale of the Royals late last year to John Sherman. Should we move the stadium downtown? Should we move um, the stadium downtown, and if so, where? And most importantly, who's going to pay for that? Goldberger, a Pulitzer Prize winning architectural critic, offers some much needed context. He tracks the evolution of baseball's taste in stadium location and design, and especially why that matters to a city. The trend right now from Baltimore to Pittsburgh to Denver to San Francisco is to put them downtown and design them to add to the character of the urban core. Paul will be joined in tonight's conversation by Kansas City's own Whitney Terrell, an associate professor at English at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's also written a review of this book, which you can find online on Lit Hub, Literary Hub. Um, Whitney, as most of you probably know, is the author of three novels, and he also co-hosts a podcast on Lit Hub called Fiction Nonfiction. Whitney has been a longtime supporter and partner with the Kansas City Public Library, and we are so lucky to have him living right here in Kansas City. Please help me welcome Whitney Terrell and Paul Goldberger. Thanks, Carrie, thank thank and, and I, I want to thank the library for putting on this event, and the library board, Jonathan Kemper, uh, and, and the staff who work with us, Steve Weberg, Steve Wolfolk, who she mentioned as well. The library is a fantastic institution. We're very lucky to have it. Look at this awesome auditorium. So, um, speaking of uh, great public spaces, this, yes, is, this yes. is one. Um, all right, Paul. I'm Libraries so and ballparks, two most yeah, important things in a city, right? <laughs> yeah. You've had this incredibly distinguished our, uh, career as an architectural critic, which maybe not everybody, I mean, people really are here to hear, hear you talk about Kauffman Stadium in the end. Right. But <laughs> I first want to have you talk to uh, the audience about who you are and what you've done prior to writing about ballparks, which ah, is a long story, it's but a long story, yeah, we'll right, get right. some of it anyway. Well, no, I've spent most of my life, I've been very lucky because I really spent my life writing about what interests me, but I guess so have you, right? I try. So, yeah, right. Or so, what pisses me off. I don't well, know. Well, that same, same thing. thing. It's, it's still interests you, whether, whether, <laughs> whether, uh, whether it pisses you off or you <laughs> like it. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've always loved architecture, I've always loved journalism, and I'm not very good at making choices. So I found a place where the two of them intersect. And I've spent most of my life writing about architecture. But did you study architecture? Studied in architectural history. Okay. Um, I went to Yale, a place that those of you who went to Princeton don't always acknowledge, but I know about nevertheless, it. I heard about it. 
uh, you know, it's a little little school, a little bit in a little bit to the north of right, right, in, okay. in, in, a, in a place called Connecticut, and um, uh, studied architectural history, art and architectural history, and uh, then began a career as a journalist. I toyed with going to architecture school, but I thought the world had enough second-rate architects. It didn't need another, necessarily. And I uh, did think I was a pretty decent writer. So I went that route. What was it and like working, as a, working at the New Yorker, for instance? Which yeah. is a, that I mean, that I was the second chapter of my career. I started at the New York Times and then went to the New Yorker. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I have, <coughs> maybe you could talk about either one. What was, what's the difference between working at the Times and the New Yorker? Those are two the great jobs to have as a they, journalist they in They were incredibly, I mean, the two great right. institutions in yeah. many ways. Um, the difference is kind of, the New York Times is like a huge university. Uh -huh. It does everything and has amazing people and a huge range, but not everybody is necessarily, you know, uh, it's, it, there's, there's some stoners and there, some... Yeah, there, right, right, exactly. It, it, it's, it's sort of a mixed <laughs> bag. I mean, everybody's at a certain level, obviously, but not necessarily, you know, the most amazing um, the New Yorker was like a small liberal arts college right. that, where everybody was as good as the best people in the big university. That's how it sort of felt to me when I went from one to the other. And I had, you know, great, great time there for Did a while. Did you office yeah. in the old New Yorker building before uh, they moved down? I moved over there in the late 90s when they, yeah, when they were still on 43rd Street. And the murals and were... And the they had actually... I, I was in the second old building, okay. they'd, but they'd moved the murals there, yeah. Maybe you yeah, could yeah, tell yeah, everyone yeah. about that. I yeah, there's some famous... Uh, James Thurber, the cartoonist, famously started drawing on the walls, and they were kept as this kind of almost sacred object. And then when the New Yorker moved across the street, they managed to cut out a piece of the wall <laughs> and take it across the street to the Thinking new of office. architecture. Right, exactly. Um, and then uh, the New Yorker was bought by the Newhouse family, which owned Condé Nast, owns still the Condé Nast magazine company. For several years, they op allowed it to operate as a separate entity. And then gradually, they started folding it into the rest of the magazine company to save money on you know, back office stuff and accounting yeah. and all the other stuff. And then it moved into the headquarters of Condé Nast and became not quite just another magazine, but not quite as special and different. Yeah, yeah. I've been to the offices down that are down in the, the replacement of the World Trade Center. Yeah, the World Trade Center, where they've now, now been for a few years, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah. one of the things I loved about Ballpark was the research you did into the earliest ballparks and how mm -hmm. emphatic you are that baseball is an urban game, right. not a game played in Iowa cornfields by... Right, right, despite Field of Dreams, yeah. which is everybody's favorite tearjerker, yeah. but it's not an accurate statement of what baseball really has been about. And I'm an urban Midwesterner, so I'm fine right. with that. Good, right? good, uh, okay. But in a, in a way, also, the beginnings of it, or maybe even specifically a New York game, I mean, you, you talk about this, that uh, according to some historians, there were nearly 100 baseball teams in Brooklyn and New York by yep. 1858. New York was a huge center of baseball. It was not the only one, but a huge one. And it was a game that was, in the early years, that really grew big in um, a lot of the um, both northeastern and midwestern industrial cities. Yeah. And it was played a lot by um, working class immigrants. Yeah. And uh, Brooklyn had all these teams, and they were sometimes made up of men from within a few block residential area, or sometimes they were connected with a factory or something yeah. like that, and they all played each other. These yeah, early yeah. chapters in the book, which were, were to me really totally new information, stuff that I really didn't know at all, that I love, and I think people will love when they read the book, you know, like, and, and that its rise was connected with the population growth of Brooklyn specifically, and half of, the, you know, like you talk about Brooklyn was 25,000 people in 1835, there were 200,000 by 1855, half of them were immigrants. We're in a sort of immigrant phobic time, and it's interesting to me the way that yeah. you talk about the connection between immigrants and this American pastime that's so important to us now. Absolutely. I mean, it was one of the things that was fascinating to me as well when, when I read it, because I, I, I hadn't known as much about it as, as I do now, uh, that in fact, so much of the game was uh, built on 
to say build on immigrant labor is that makes it sound like players, you know, right? But immigrant players, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And well, you know, in the early years, it was also it was it, it transitioned into being a spectator sport, but it didn't start out that way. It started out just as a thing people played, and then it got more and more organized, and people started going to see it. And a lot of the early games of the New York teams played in uh, across the Hudson River in Hoboken, right? In some in a field that was called actually Illusion Field. Yeah. And uh, but then. Uh, and you mentioned like yeah, I remember, there's yeah. the one part in the book where you talk like, well, they played a lot of games in Madison Square because it was an open space. I was like, oh, that's where Madison Square Garden is yes. now, right? No, 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 no. I'm wrong. The the first Madison Square Garden oh, okay. was at Madison Square. But there's just uh, an open field. The one field that's that there now in. is the third. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, they moved away because, in fact, uh, development was coming up all around it. Right. And uh, it was it was too hard. Uh, you know. While I talk a lot in the book, and the theme of the book is really about how baseball is more a city game, yeah. nevertheless, it, was, it tended to be played kind of on the outskirts, because even in those 19th century years, even when land was cheap, cities were also growing and developing really fast in this country, and you, you didn't put a ball field right in the very central center of the central business district next to the bank, right. you know, even then you needed more land and it was, too, it was too expensive. So they would be kind of on the edge, but the cities were growing so fast that those parcels of land were often then surrounded by development and became in the center of a neighborhood. So speaking of- Fenway Park is a good example yeah. of that. And we're gonna Boston. get to that, yeah, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never been there, but you're gonna tell me all about it. Um, Speaking of immigrants, you have some interesting passages in the book where you talk about the bifurcated world of baseball spectators, just a little later than the period we're talking about yes, now. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, in your book, one half of this world is represented by Chris Vondera, a German immigrant who bought the St. Louis Browns in the 1880s. Could you yep. sort of introduce people sure, to him if sure. they're not familiar with him? And um, talk well, about this is a great park? story, and this is, this is a, a Missouri story, um, even though it's the other side of the state. Uh, Chris Vondera was a... German immigrant, a tavern owner, and... Who had like a... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get to this later. Go ahead, I interrupt. But he, he had a beer station in the yes. outfield of well, his baseball. Well, he bought the St. Louis Browns right. because fantastic. he thought it would be a good way to sell more beer. Yeah. And he opened up a kind of branch of his tavern, I guess, is the, the only thing you could like call it. balls would like roll in among the chairs. Even, like a little beer garden out in the outfield that was the, <laughs> the sort of branch of his tavern from down the street. And then he had... To, he was good at cross-marketing because yeah. he also had the waiters in the, in the actual tavern dressed up in, in Brown's uniforms. <laughs> so he was pushing both directions. And, you got to uh, talk to the new Royals ownership he, about putting he, a bar in there. He had a lot of other yeah. sort of things to entertain people. And he billed Sportsman's Park, the you know, old St. Louis ballpark, as the Coney Island of the West. Yeah. And it was all about entertainment. So... You know, if we think that there's too much distraction in ballparks today, it has a long, a long history. But he was like a working class. He wanted a working class audience. He kept yes. ticket prices down to a quarter. Mm -hmm. He served beer. He did all this other stuff to sort of yep. draw in working class. It was class all about entertaining the working class. And that yeah. was like American League sort of eventually. It was something, he was part of some of a group of teams that were officially called the American Association. Right. Um, it was colloquially known as the Beer and Whiskey League. Okay. <laughs> and, That's um, the league I wanted to be in. The beer, right, the Beer okay. and Whiskey League was the cool thing, clearly. Um, and it was their um, opposite number was the National League. Yeah. Now the American Association guys. is not the uh, root of today's American League, but the National League is the root of today's National League, and it started out trying to make exact, push baseball in the opposite direction. It was all about making it more... Presbyterian. Presbyterian, good word. <laughs> exclusive, virtuous. Uh, they had rules about there was no baseball played on Sunday. There was no alcohol served in any of the ballparks. Um, and it was all about how baseball represents virtue and, you know, uprightness and every noble thing in the American character. But a lot of those things were actually code words for a certain kind of elitism. 
and keeping and, out the and keeping out the riffraff and so forth. Would yes. fight. And yes. get we drunk. would allow they would allow the riffraff in where, where they could make money from them. But in fact, in many of the ballparks then, particularly the National League ones, uh, there was a very rigid economic segregation. So yeah. you know the bleachers were completely separate from the rest of the ballpark. You couldn't walk from a cheap seat into the grandstand area. You had a separate entrance, separate bathrooms, oh, really? so forth. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a very rigid economic segregation. But some of that, you know, to be fair, was kind of the weird way people did things in those days. You know, the um, old Metropolitan Opera House in New York, which was built in 1883, Yes. Um, around the time that baseball was getting bigger and bigger and a lot of the very stuff we're talking about was happening, um, the upper balcony, the cheapest seats, were called the family circle, and you entered them from a separate door on the street through their own lobby and their own staircase, and it never connected to the main lobby so that the fancy people didn't have to mix with the poor people upstairs. So there was a kind of expectation of economic segregation in those days that was considered strangely normal by both sides of the equation for a while. Then Your avatars away. for that are, well, because we know in Kansas City that, that Chicago, nothing good comes from Chicago. Uh, William Holbert, who owned the White, Chicago White Stock. Yes, he was the founder of the National League. And then Albert yeah, yeah. Spalding, who everyone will recognize because of Spalding, which still is Spalding still Sporting Goods. He actually founded Spalding Sporting Goods. He, they were the great, you know, advocates of the National League and virtue and this whole, and the kind of mythology that led to um, uh, ultimately Field of Dreams and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you have some of Spalding's writing in but, the book. Like oh, this, Spalding this was, he was wildly over the top <laughs> in, about American character and nobility yes. and manhood and... Yeah, and yeah, all, yeah that, all that stuff. And all this virtuous stuff. And, um, but it also led to what was later revealed to be an entirely and completely um, fake history of the origins of baseball, we, uh, the, the National League commissioned a sort of study, or actually all of Major League Baseball, a sort of study commission right. on the history of baseball that <coughs> determined that uh, it was invented by this man named Abner Doubleday on a field uh, in rural Cooperstown, New York, which is why the Baseball Hall of Fame is in Cooperstown. Uh, baseball historians subsequently discovered that that was basically a fiction. <laughs> created to further this myth of r kind of rural virtue, because since cities were considered dirty and messy and, again, full of immigrants and all right. that, uh, this noble game could not possibly have really had its roots there. So they devised this history, and it uh, carried the day enough to get the Hall of Fame built in Cooperstown. But in fact, now even the Hall of Fame itself has acknowledged that it was pretty much made up. So, what is thought to be the actual origins? Do you know? I don't. I don't. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's a, a wonderful uh, guy named John Thorne, who's a fantastic writer, who is now the official historian of Major League Baseball, who wrote a book called Baseball in the Garden of Eden. Okay. And it traces the early years of how the game itself developed, and in fact, it developed from many games, uh, some of which are English games, like not only cricket, but rounders. And there were different versions played in different areas. Uh, a lot of it was in New England. Some there was no, uh, like, uh, James Naismith There was no moment. single like moment like James basketball. Naismith with basketball, okay. no. Ah. And they tried to pretend Abner Doubleday was that, but it really apparently wasn't. And then it all kind of gradually came together, and as it got more and more popular, there was apparently one set of rules played in New York and another in Boston and so forth. And at one point, as um, the game became more and more common and more popular, and intercity games began to be played, um, there was a kind of big summit meeting, and they actually brought together representatives of teams from various cities into New York, and they agreed on codifying a set of rules. So uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think, for example, you know, the number of innings was not 
nine Best. everywhere and oh, things wow. like that. And certain other very key things were actually different versions were played differently. Then beginning in the mid 19th century onward, those things were more, were more um, codified. All right, so there is a section in your book after the part we're talking about which you call the golden age, right? right. And I wanna talk a little bit about that, you know. Um, why, when did the golden age of American ballparks arrive and why was it golden in your view? Okay. What makes it? Well, the golden age, I, I guess I should say first, the, uh, there was an age before the golden age which as things were getting bigger and bigger and baseball was becoming more and more popular and becoming more a spectator sport, yeah. um, the, the fields with a few seats became more and more elaborate and the constructions became and bigger and more elaborate. They were all built and wood. And started burning down. And they started burning <laughs> down. And um, the most elaborate of all was this amazing thing in Boston called South End Grounds that had these huge Victorian towers, and it really was Beautiful a, picture a, of amazing. That in the book. Yeah. It only lasted I, I, something like eight or nine years, and it burned down. And um, turned out the owners had underinsured it, so they couldn't afford to rebuild it. And, um, uh, but then, as fireproof construction became possible, right. steel, concrete, and so forth, uh, they began to be built that way. And baseball was becoming still bigger, Remember, it was other than a little bit of boxing, it was essentially our only professional sport in this country. Right. And um, uh, another thing, uh, let me digress for half a second to oh. say that another thing that contributed to its growth, by the way, and this is another wonderful reminder of how baseball connects to everything, um, was the development of inner city train service. Oh. It was when there were train connections between various cities that the leagues actually really developed and, and professional baseball got Oh, meaning bigger. they could travel to play Because, yeah, you else, couldn't really... Right? I mean, that's Instead why, of riding you know, your horse the, down right, there or whatever. Right, exactly. I mean, a, t a, a team in Brooklyn could really only play another team in Brooklyn or maybe right. across the river in New York. It, it, you couldn't play a team in Boston or Chicago or whatever yeah. um, if it was going to take... Three, three or four days to get there and back each time. And, and you certainly couldn't have a reliable schedule. But once there was inner city train service, uh, then suddenly everything began to fall into place and real modern baseball developed. Sort of by the same token, just to jump ahead, it was only at the moment of um, jet travel permitting fast coast-to-coast -coast travel in this country that baseball, professional base, Major League Baseball expanded to California. Yeah. It wasn't there until, they, the, the, it's not an accident those two things coincided. So, of these classic sta yeah. stadiums, which most of these will be familiar, but not all of them, Ebbets Field, obviously, right. we all know about Wrigley in Chicago. Right. Scheib Park in Philly, oh, which I'd Park never heard great. of. I wish we had, I brought pictures, because Scheib Park was incredible. There are beautiful pictures in the book. Yes. And these people the will all have really access to right, that right, book, right. by the way, if they right. want. Scheib Park was 1909. It was really one of the earliest of the, the golden age. And one of the most ornate, actually. It was, um, it was like an elaborate Beaux-Arts building on the outside. Yeah. But then you go in through this huge rotunda, and then you're in the field. And then if you saw it from the other side, it was just a field. But if you saw it from the home plate side, it looked like a monumental building. Like you could have thought it was an opera house or something like that. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, a, an incredibly important moment in the evolution of this. And then, of course, came Forbes Field in uh, Pittsburgh. Right. And then... Um, Fenway, Tiger Stadium, Tiger Stadium. Ebbets, Wrigley, and so Which forth. of those is yeah. the greatest? And, and by what, what's, what yeah, are your okay. standards of judgment? I mean, you have it, you do develop a really clear standard yeah. way of thinking about yeah. ballparks in um, the book, and maybe you could explain that to people, like what you think is good. Well, it's a combination of, of things, really. I mean, first, I mean, on the exterior, is it a really nice piece of civic architecture that feels at home in a city? And as if it belongs in a city and it enriches a city. Um, because a ballpark, among other things, is an important part of public space. It's part of the thesis of the book is to say that, you know, along with parks that we were beginning to develop in mid-19th century and, and even cemeteries, changing up, 
the ballpark was one of the ways in which um, working class immigrants, or just working class people in general, could experience some bit of the countryside. Remember, if you worked in a factory, you probably worked six days a week, had nothing but Sundays off. You had no way to go to the country. You had no way yeah. to, you know, and going to the ballpark was one of the experiences you could have. That's another reason the National League's ban on Sunday games had a whole other agenda. It was about keeping immigrants out in part right. because they, it was the only day they could go for many of them. So anyway, there's that, but there's also, of course, the field itself and the seating and how close you felt to the action, how well you saw it, uh, and the way in which the whole thing worked together as a kind of communal space. I, one of the things that is remarkable to me of these fields, the only one that I've ever seen, I haven't been to Fenway, but I've, I've, I've never seen a game at Wrigley, but I've jogged around Wrigley, I've okay. stayed near it. It's amazing to me how, how much it fits into the neighborhood that it's in. Yes. It doesn't feel imp overimposing. It right. just, it's right there. I was like, I expected it to be a big deal, but I'm like, no, no, it's just right here. It's, it's yeah, this building. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, you have this enormous thing that seats 40,000 people, and yet it just kind of fits there with all these houses around it, and it all seems absolutely normal. You're, you're, you, you put it very well, I think, by, by saying that. Probably, although I never saw it, Ebbets Field was actually the very best of all. Really? Um, I mean, it's so legendary because, because it was lost, in essence, right? Partly. And, of course, a lot of important history happened there. Does everybody know what know, Ebbets, Field Ebbets Field is? Where the Dodgers played and also where baseball was integrated. Major League Baseball was integrated because Jackie Robinson was, was actually, let the record show, seen by the Dodgers when he played for the Negro League team in Kansas City yeah. and was signed in Kansas City to come to Brooklyn and play for the Dodgers uh, in the 40s. But so Kansas City plays an important role in that history. But um, um, I, I think it was probably the very best, actually, yeah. both because of its history and just its physical qualities. Is that the one where you said, though, that, I mean, there, there are also funny things where they, they screw things up in these parts, yeah, 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 <laughs> which yeah, yeah, yeah. I find amusing. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Was that the one where they had only one entrance and, they, and they, you couldn't get everyone in the ballpark in time? Like there was a rotunda or something? They there was a everyone? rotunda and it was actually designed <laughs> too small. Yeah, and they you would, couldn't right, get right, in. Right. I mean, it would have never passed the fire laws today either in terms of people getting out. Um, they did make some tweaks okay. uh, and, fixed you that. Know, to fix it over time, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, 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 they also forgot a press box, which is sort of interesting. Um, <laughs> but all that eventually got taken care of. Um, but you know, they were the early ballparks. While they were kind of grand and beautiful and buildings. Um, also were kind of creatures of circumstance. And they, you know, the, the, their shapes were often determined by the streets of the neighborhood or by how much land the owners could buy. Griffith in Washington, D.C. Um, had an amazing notch cut out of right field because there were two houses that would not sell. <laughs> and so they kind of shaped it around. Uh, I mean, it was far enough out, so... Like that Bugs Bunny cartoon yeah, where it, he refuses to sell his house yeah, and they build a... Right, uh, right. Uh, and okay. so... Uh, and, of course, the most famous example is, is the Green Monster at Fenway, which um, has to do with the way a street just cut to the, right close to the edge of the site and could not allow the field as much space in left field as in right field. But that kind of asymmetry and difference and idiosyncrasy, we could really say, is a key part of baseball and baseball history. You know, unlike a, a hockey rink or a basketball yeah. I mean, that's like court your or here, a football right? gridiron, yeah, every ball field is a little bit different. The diamond is exact and precise. The outfield varies, and there's kind of no rules about the outfield, and theoretically it can be infinite. It could go on forever. Like the polo grounds were in... Oh, polo grounds pretty much was kind of pretty close. To, right, yeah. it, was, it was so far. Um, but, you know, there, there are no absolute rules. Right. It just... All right, so speaking of, yeah. the, all those parks had their idiosyncrasies and mm -hmm. were weird and strange, as you've mentioned. 
So then, as the book progresses forward in time, we enter what I call the sort of Empire Strikes Back period of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of baseball stadiums, which you call the era of concrete donuts, right. beginning in the, in the 50s. Could you sort of sure. set that up well, for you, us a you, little you, bit? You just, summed, you just said all that <laughs> needs to be said about okay. it, I think, too. I mean, it, it, but another part of the thesis of the book is that baseball reflects our whole cultural attitude about cities. Our, Right. over the years. And as we were everywhere in this country, pretty much rejecting cities and moving out wherever the automobile would take us. Right. Uh, in the post-war era, we started moving baseball out too. Um, so this is like Cleveland's mistake by the lake. Is, one, is that part of that? Cleveland's mistake yeah. by the lake is almost in a category by itself, okay. I would say, because it was, built, it was built in the late 30s when oh, nothing right. else was, was being built at all. About that. And what it actually did was it, it's actually the beginning of a very um, uh, pernicious trend, which was municipal financing of stadiums, which uh, nobody else was doing then, and Cleveland just decided to do it. Right. And uh, it, it opened a lot of bad doors, I would say, and it was actually a, a not a good uh, stadium because it was far too big. It was 80,000 yeah. seats. And it, it was bad on so many levels. And Cleveland is... But it led to know. one great movie. Yes. Which I just recently watched with my son. Uh -huh. so, so that Major League holds up. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. That's all set there. And that. Anyway, yeah, so the, true, true, the true, other, yeah, yeah. what are other concrete donuts that were the, the well, worst, the most egregious offenders? The most egregious era? offenders were probably uh, RFK in Washington. Yeah. Um, Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia. Oh my God. I went to a Pink Floyd uh, Three concert Rivers in Pittsburgh. Um, oh, Candlestick in San Francisco. Yeah. A truly horrible place. Um, and uh, oh, and there were plenty of others. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then uh, actually, even worse was the later part of that generation when they foolishly thought that the way to solve the problems of those things was to put roofs on them. So we got things like the King Dome in Seattle, which is truly the worst place in which I have ever seen a baseball game in my life. <laughs> and um, went there, and you know, and, and, and many others. So but that, we, was a, that was a grim time because it, we were, and it was also based on a myth. I'm talking a lot about myths tonight. I, I didn't mean to be, but um, baseball's about myth. It's yeah, a, that's it true. Is well, that, myth, there's the good myths and there's yeah. bad myths. Uh, by, maybe I should have said fallacy. Right. The fallacy that you can have football and baseball in the same ballpark. Right. And the here's same where park, and you can't you can't without compromising both of them a lot. And here's where we come off looking semi decent or even better than Namely, that. No, no, uh, Kansas we City. We didn't do this. Kansas City was the only smart city in America in the 1970s, actually, in that it is the only place other than L.A. where the Do Dodger Stadium was built for baseball only. Yeah. But between, in the post-war era, for several decades, only Dodger Stadium and um, uh, Arrowhead and Kauffman were built uh, as baseball only places. You Everybody else thought you could do it all in the same stadium and we got this whole generation of truly horrible places. You're very complimentary about the, about the architecture of that stadium, although you point out that one of the things it doesn't do is be irregular because it's right. you know, set in an open space, but what are the things that you think are good about Coffin? Like what makes it work as a stadium? What makes it work, I mean I'm, I'm mixed about it, but the first thing that has to be said about it that's really good is that it was built as a baseball park not a multi-purpose stadium. Right. And again, you know, Kansas City deserves credit for making that decision. Um, and then um, there's a beautiful kind of lyrical flow to the way the uh, walls kind of curve down it is toward the outfield. I mean, I've it's spent quite a lot beautiful. of time in that yeah, stadium. It's quite lovely, really. I mean, if you see it from the home plate side, it looks a little more like a lot of other big concrete stadiums. Outside of it. Outside, it's not so yeah. much when you're walking but, in the stadium, it's not so beautiful. Right, right. And then, you know, they've, they've done a lot of work on it in the last generation when uh, the team decided to stay there and, and uh, re-up. And I think it's actually 
better and more comfortable in some ways than it was before. Uh, but the, the nicest thing is that kind of lyrical thing in the outfield, the way the sides go down, and then, you know, the waterfall and the scoreboard and all that stuff, which is kind of a cool relic of a certain mid-century style that's, that I like a lot. Yeah. But like, even though I like it, I don't like it so much that I would argue against a downtown stadium. I think it's actually... Oh, we're getting there. Yeah, okay, I would love good, there to good. be a downtown okay. stadium. Right, I'm in right. fa I have mm -hmm. a couple of steps I want to lead you through before okay, we get to okay. that part. Okay, take your time. One of them is the next thing that happened after the bad era was Camden Yards. You spent yes. a lot of time talking about Camden, Camden Yards. Camden Yards was transformational. Right. And I think it's actually the only time... Everybody's familiar with this. this is in Baltimore. It's Baltimore. How many uh, people have been to Camden Yards? Any? Oh, a lot. Wow, not many. You know, it is, um, the Baltimore Orioles completely changed baseball in 1992 with the opening of that ballpark. And Bad we kicked their ass in the playoffs. Couple well, of years. you know, look... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that, unfortunately, good architecture is not a guarantee of good <laughs> baseball. And so, you know, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, it, it is the only, you know, every, every building type evolves a certain amount. I mean, yeah. libraries, hospitals, uh, schools, houses, everything evolves and changes over time. Baseball parks is the only example I can think of where one single building completely turned around a whole way of building things, 180 degrees. And everybody started building downtown after Everybody that? started building, well, most built downtown, not all, but everybody b started building baseball only and fairly traditional in layout, often more eccentric right. and idiosyncratic, which it very much I mean, there's like Pac Bell Park with that, you know, the, my wife's from San Francisco, so I go to that park, and like right. being able to hit a home run into the ocean is awesome. Fantastic. I mean, San Francisco <laughs> went from having one of the worst ballparks in the major league to having one of the best, actually, uh, leaping over everyone else in one fell swoop. Um, but Camden Yards was transformational, really was. It, it, so... Mm -hmm. That was, a, was that an HOK stadium? It was an HOK okay, so stadium, that's what I so talk it was about now. designed yeah. out of Kansas City. Yeah! Yes, yes, yes. So we have this amazing design firm here in this long tradition. I wondered, and you're very emphatic in the book about, about how important that has been. In fact, I'm going to quote you. By happenstance, Kansas City became, for all intents and purposes, the nation's center of sports architecture from the last quarter century of the 20th century onward. Many of the architectural designs for sports facilities all over the world would emerge from this medium-sized Midwestern city that otherwise had no claim as an architectural center. Elaborate. How did this right, well, happen? Um, it happened. Are they actually, just good? I mean, uh, why did they get all that business? Well, um, it kind of goes back to um, the Arrowhead Kaufman complex. Uh -huh. um, when that was originally done, um, it was, the basic idea was done by um, an architect named Charles Deaton, who came up with this notion of a rolling roof. Right. That we talk would, about it all the time. Right, it's the greatest would, ghost of our stadium. That would sit in between the two stadiums and could go roll in one direction or the other, depending on which one was in use. And when it was not in use on either one, it would be in the center and would kind of create a covered plaza. And uh, that was the early 70s, when nobody was doing anything remotely like that. It was quite visionary. Uh, everybody said, this is really cool. And they started building it, and then discovered that um, it was, not only was the technology not fully there to do it smoothly and easily, but it was going to be quite a bit more expensive than uh, the county had anticipated. And so it was value engineered out. And so, but by then they'd already begun to build the two separate stadiums, so they just kept going. Um, Charles Deaton ended up working for a local firm, I think called Kevitt and Myers, which then merged with another firm. But it got so much attention that they then started doing, getting other jobs to do ballparks and other athletic facilities. And then they attracted the attention of HOK, which is an enormous international firm that happens to be St. Louis-based, that was not strong in sports architecture. And they said, hey, uh, guys, why don't you let us buy you and become part of us? And then 
uh, will be sports architects, but you guys can keep doing it. So several of their architects said, okay, they became the sports division of HOK, but set the condition that they would not move to St. Louis, they would remain in Kansas City. And that they were smart, aggressive, and got an enormous amount of work uh, and just kept growing. Remember, it's not a, you know, there aren't all that many ballparks and arenas and football stadiums that get built. And it's not as though, unlike houses or office buildings or schools, what have you, it's not like we need a hundred different architecture firms doing them because if we had a hundred architecture firms doing them, 90 of them would be out of work most of the time. <laughs> so um, it's small and specialized and they were able to say to clients, you know, we know how all this stuff works. Right. And indeed they do. Um, that firm over the years eventually broke away from the parent firm, HOK, uh, and then changed its name to Populous, and they're still across the street. Uh, but um, Does this mean we should their get success them? had made, made Kansas City, uh, as I said, yeah, the world capital. I mean, sports architecture is one of the major exports of Kansas City. <laughs> so. We're going to open this up for questions in just one second because uh, we're going to, I'm going to try to end this at, at 730 so you can come up and sign uh, and, have, uh, and have Paul sign books for you. Um, but now's the time when I want you to talk about the downtown stadium in Kansas City that we should have built with the, the, obviously the architects from Populous. Uh, I, I think y it would be awfully hard for Kansas City to not have. Let's get that firm from Denver. You're right, right, exactly. I mean, <laughs> there are a couple of other people doing stuff. And in fact, uh, Bjark Ingels, rather interesting and talented New York architect, is now doing uh, the new ballpark for Oakland, which is actually one of the most interesting and, and promising projects around. But Populous has done some wonderful stuff, uh, including the ballpark that I think is my very favorite among relatively recent ones, which is PNC in Pittsburgh, mm. and as well as you know, uh, yeah, Camden Yard, San Francisco, which is fantastic, yeah. and quite a number of others. So um, it would be hard to imagine that uh, the team would not select the local architect, given that the local architect happens also to be the most famous sports architecture firm in the world. So, you know, it's not like they would say, ah, we, you know, these are just local guys, we better go to some big guy from New York or Chicago, when the biggest people in that industry happen to be the local people. Yeah. So, no, I think the big question about a downtown ballpark is not who the architect would be, but precisely where the site should be, yeah. and how it would be paid for. Right. But, uh, for me, there's no question that it's the right thing for Kansas City to do. I mean, the thing that is least appealing about Kaufman is the location. Yeah. Um, and the there fact that... There never was any economic development around the no, stadium. No. It's just, you know, if you drive out there... That's it's right, in a kind of a nowhere place. Huh. And you have to drive to it and from it. It's surrounded by a sea of asphalt parking spaces. It's not connected to anything. And... Uh, what we've seen in the years since um, Baltimore is how beautifully baseball integrates into a whole urban fabric. And people want that, they like it, they love being able to walk or take a streetcar to a game, they love being able to have something to eat, drink, go to other places, combine it with other things, and so forth. And that is all those things were available, by the way, at which you write about it quite a bit about at the old Metropolitan Stadium, which I yes. never saw, but was at what, 18th. Mun and municipal, sorry, municipal, municipal, municipal not Stadium, Twenty Second in Brooklyn. Yeah, Twenty Second in Brooklyn. So, yeah, yeah. You know that that was the site of of baseball stadiums in Kansas City up until the the 70s, and, and right. the Chiefs right. played there in their early. In fact, I think they were playing there the last time they won the Super Bowl. Speaking the Chiefs of were playing there, and of course, um, but underscoring the point that, that a good ballpark is not going to work for football. Yeah. Because Municipal Stadium was so much a baseball park, so completely, right. and such, so good a baseball park in its layout and everything else. To make it work for football, they had to put 
uh, huge rows of temporary seating oh, into I the outfield uh, on one whole side. And as a result of that, um, the Chiefs could not play any home games for the first month of the season. Oh, that seems bad. Because it was the overlap <laughs> with the baseball season. So wow. they had to wait for the baseball season to end before they could actually convert it to football use because it really was, was so much of a, naturally, a natural baseball park. I mean, and this is part of what your book is about, too. And by the way, if you have a question, step up to the mic. Now's the time. No, no, walk right up here. Um, uh, my dad remembers and has told me stories about going to that stadium when the A's were leaving and it was mm -hmm. known and nobody was there and getting a whole pile of foul balls because he would just run around and pick them up. Um, that was his memory. Right, right, right. So here we have our questioners. Okay. Oh. Thanks. Uh, I'm from Chicago, but I've been here 10 years, so I'm fully behind the local Robert teams. Mikes. Uh, how much would you say the longevity of Wrigley Field and uh, Fenway Park has to do with their locations? Um, you know, I know that all the Sturm und Drang over the lights, and right. when Comiskey Park closed, even though that place, <laughs> a lot of blocked view or no view, that was traumatic for a lot of old White Sox fans. But mm -hmm. how much, you know, uh, their locations are so into the neighborhood. Completely. Um, I mean, I think it's a lot of different historical circumstances that led those two great ballparks from the golden age to be retained. Uh, we almost lost Fenway. I mean, the Red Sox, under the previous ownership, were working on plans to replace it. And then uh, the team in the end was, there's no certainty it would have happened, but they were serious about doing it. But then ultimately they sold the team. The, the subsequent ownership uh, decided that was crazy and that they had a sort of a great asset that if they could only upgrade and modernize gently a little bit, would be worth it, which turned out to be absolutely the case. Um, Chicago, yeah, I mean, it is, it is beautifully integrated into the neighborhood and it remains one of the most beloved places there is. Um, on the other hand, so are other, other places that we, we were not lucky enough to keep. I mean, it's ironic that Ebbets Field in Brooklyn was lost because it could be spectacular today. And now, you know, every, it went in the 50s partly because nobody cared about Brooklyn and the fan base had moved to the suburbs and so forth and so on. Uh, today, everybody wants to be in Brooklyn. And yep, no, yeah. if it had a ballpark that actually in some ways was even better than Wrigley and Fenway, in its heart, it would probably be the nicest place of all. But uh, it's, it's, there's always many, many factors. But yes, location is a big part of it. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. 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 <clears throat> so I know that in the cities with the multi-purpose teams like Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, they knocked those down and built separate right. baseball and football stadiums. Well, here we already have separate exactly. baseball and football stadiums. So if they were to build the ballpark downtown, would they necessarily follow suit with football as well, or would they just leave Arrowhead where it is? Um, and ha I, I'm quite sure they'd leave Arrowhead where it is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is my understanding is the Chiefs would actually wanted to acquire Kaufman as a practice field. Like, like, the, like they would turn the baseball field into a football field? Right. But, well, not with seating, but they would use it as a practice field. Um, and so that's one, one reason. The other is that football doesn't fit downtown the way baseball does. I mean, I mean football, you want a huge parking lot because yeah. there's no and tailgating. And there's only eight right, games right. a there, year. Right, there are several reasons, and tailgating is a very important one of those reasons. That it's part of the culture of football. Uh, people do tailgate, you need a parking lot, and so forth. Um, also, a football stadium is invariably bigger, um, and therefore, I think, a little more intrusive in a city. Uh, base, a baseball park, while it's hardly small, is just enough smaller so it kind of fits into a city nicely and well. And then the final reason that I, maybe is the most important is, um, a football stadium is used eight times a year. Right. 
a baseball park at the minimum is used 81 times a year, so it's 10 times as often. And the thing that kills a city is dead things that aren't operating. And so right. it's, <laughs> it's enough that we have, you know, every city needs a convention center, but sadly they're big boxes that are empty often. Um, we don't want another big empty thing all the time. So my strong argument would be leave Arrowhead where it is, let them expand and take over the whole complex and move the Royals into downtown. And I guess, uh, well, and I don't mean that's to, just um, to uh, stay that mic for so long, but whenever I see, whenever I, uh, whenever I see um, the, 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 the proposal for a downtown ballpark service on Facebook, there are the inevitable negative Facebook comments. Well, how will ever, well, well, what will people do for parking? Well, how, how have they been trying to address that? They'll figure it out. I mean, <laughs> they figured it out. You know, San Francisco has minimal parking and it seems to work. Um, most of them do. You know, you can have, first, there are more and more people living downtown, and more and more people will walk, or they'll park in an outlying areas and have a shuttle. Um, it will work. It, uh, it has, it, what has worked so well in, you know, a dozen or more other cities, including, by the way, Houston, which is one of the most automobile centric cities in the world, and they moved from the Astrodome into downtown, and it's worked. So uh, it would work here, too. Yes, sir. In your book, you argue that HOK's original design for Camden was going to be another concrete dome. Right. So without the pushback of Jacobs, Smith, and right. Luciano, yes. would we just have a proliferation of concrete domes? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, there's no, co yes, it is definitely true that the first scheme that HOK presented to the Orioles was, it wasn't a dome actually, but it was a more traditional right. concrete open stadium. Uh, in fact, the owner of the Orioles then once said to me, uh, I think what they did was run to Chicago and give that to the White Sox because <laughs> The new Comiskey Park kind of looked a lot like. Sorry, earlier White Sox guy. Looked uh, a lot like what they tried to sell there. And indeed, um, it opened the year before, so it's possible, given that it did take longer to build the Baltimore one. Um, anyway, uh, but then they, you know, they got it and they produced something quite wonderful. I think if if that hadn't happened, somewhere something else would have happened because. You know, we were beginning to experience a huge resurgence of downtown living, downtown working, downtown entertainment, and so forth. And it might not have happened in Baltimore in 1992. It could have happened in another city five years later, ten years later. But some other team would have said at some point, we don't want a concrete donut that looks like a freeway overpass we want a real baseball park. And you know, architects would have ultimately, I think, responded. Okay. That's, that's my sense. But you know, we never know 100% because what happened, happened. And right, because it's customer pushback. Customer didn't want the product. Well, that's, yes. And ultimately, in all of architecture, what clients want matters, you know? <laughs> you know sort of so. And, our, and uh, one of the things that the people at Populous are proudest of is that you know, they, they serve their clients, and they do what their clients wanted. Happily here, they had a very, very enlightened client uh, who wanted something important. Um, you know, another, but to the point about um, downtown revivals were just happening any, it, anyway, and it would have made its way into baseball somewhere for the first time. It's one of the reasons I feel for Kansas City that Maybe it's just as well that it didn't happen 15 years ago when there was a minor push to move the, the yeah. Royals downtown. Um, because I don't know that downtown Kansas City was truly ready for it yet. Um, and we might have expected, or you might have expected, too much from a ballpark. It can't alone turn around to downtown. But what it can do is be a fantastic reinforcement of a larger revival and make it even stronger and push it forward even more and connect to all the other things happening. 
today as opposed to 15 years ago, you know, there are so many more people living in downtown Kansas City. There are more people working. There's more entertainment. There are whole new neighborhoods that are developing. And the whole momentum of the city is more focused downtown than it used to be. So in fact, now it wouldn't all be on the shoulders of a ballpark to turn around to downtown, which it wouldn't have succeeded at doing anyway. So. All right, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm that White Sox guy. So I was curious your impression, good and bad, of the old Comiskey. And the, the Oakland scheme. And the, the old Comiskey. Oh, the old Comiskey, sorry. And, and okay. that uh, monstrosity of the new Comiskey, yeah. Well, I agree with you. I just said <laughs> um, it is it's the last of the concrete donuts it was it opened one year before Camden Yards in Baltimore changed everything um, it was out of date the minute it opened um, and it's a sort of sad story um, I gather although I haven't been back to it in a while that they a few years ago did some uh. changes that People say made it a little bit better. I think a better way to put it is it made it a little less awful. Um, it, the best comment about it was from a really uh, perceptive writer named John Pastier, who's another architecture writer who loves baseball, who calculated that the front row of the upper deck at the New Comiskey Park is farther from the field than the last row of the old upper deck in the old one. Wow. And so much of baseball is about intimacy and how, how can you maneuver things so that the greatest number of people are the closest to the field and the most connected to the field, which is again another important thing that Camden Yards in Baltimore did. They actually really thought of that. Many of the concrete donuts are truly just circles that were about this abstract shape of a big circle because you could kind of put a diamond in it, you could put a football gridiron in it, it all kind of just could be plumped into a circle. But in fact, it doesn't work for baseball. Just very briefly, the good and bad of the old Comiskey? Of the old Comiskey? The good and the bad. The old Comiskey, was, I, I thought, was funky and nice. Um, it didn't have quite the truly beautiful appeal of Wrigley uptown. Um, it didn't have the magic of the brick wall and the ivy and all that stuff. It didn't integrate into the neighborhood as well. But it's a it was a wonderful ballpark. And um, you know, the best of those early generation of ballparks were, they were among the only buildings ever built that sort of combined funkiness and monumentality two things that are almost always mutually exclusive in architecture. And that one, it sort of exemplified that. I mean, there was something kind of grand and funky about it at the same time. And it was, I, I found it very likable, uh, but not lovable, as Wrigley was always lovable. But, and it, but it was still 100 times better than the new one. And you get the last word. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, I was going to say, I, I agree with you on, all, on everything, actually, and I would love to have Not even my wife doesn't agree with me on everything. <laughs> I, I'm better than she is. <laughs> no, um, I would love to have, I'm all for downtown development. I've lived in Kansas City and watched it grow over the right. years. Would love to have the stadium downtown. We have this one cultural part of our city, though, that is maybe not like other towns because we're from the Midwest and we're cattle and we're into barbecue. And you talk about football being a tailgating kind of sport right. and baseball right. not. But here, tailgating is a really big part of baseball. And I wonder how the general public that goes to those games in tailgates, I mean, they spend hours setting up their tailgates for the Royals baseball games. And it may not be as big as it is for the Chiefs, but I wonder right. they well, won't get to do that question. anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I would say that the tailgates at Royal Stadium, and I'm a season ticket holder and have been for 20 years, are pathetic and can just go away when we move the stadium. <laughs> I thought downtown. that's what he was going to say. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to defer to the local on this, actually. Um, I mean, look. Um, I'm not a tailgater. I prefer to go to a restaurant myself, but I, just, I know there's a lot of people who tailgate, but 
You were kind. He said. Well, that well, uh, the, you know, I, I defer to the local and his wisdom. Okay. Um, I said at the talk at the downtown uh, council this morning that, you know, any city that in, that is big enough to contain both Ar Arthur Bryant's and the Nelson Atkins Museum <laughs> has to be more interesting and complicated and wonderful than most cities in America. Thank you and for that so comment. And <laughs> so I still believe that and, uh, you know, just do your barbecue some other time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Could we give a round of applause for thank Paul? You. Well, thank, thank you, Whitney. Thank you.